I mean, when I was in Paris and living in Shakespeare and Company, as was mentioned earlier, you know, my father had cut me off from when I dropped out of medical school. I thought I got to make a living somehow. And well, I have various languages. Let me start translating. There was a little magazine there called Two Cities that was run by uh, an, uh, an Antillian, a Caribbean uh, psychiatrist who was a poet for some time. Two Cities was England and Paris, London and pa Paris. So it was, you know, and he offered me first translations, and I translated some Ceylon for him in 66, but it never came out because the magazine then closed. You know, it, Jean Fanchette was the man's name, a uh, poet uh, from Martinique, I, I believe. Uh, so translation in that sense was always a, an immense possibility there. And for example, when I came to the US in 67 to go to Bard, I thought, well, yeah, my dad gave me money again to go to college and the ticket to go to America. Maybe I don't want to go to college. Maybe I just want to be a beatnik and hit the road, you know. So what will I do then to make money? Well, I could translate. So I took the two books that I liked most in 67 in France and brought them with me. And I sat at Bard College in my dorm and thought, well, let me send, translate a chapter of each and send it to New York publishers, right? And maybe that will they will pick it up and then I can become independent and translate and maybe go on the road. And I sent the chapters and never anything came back or two negatives. They were difficult books. It was Derrida's De la Grammatologie <laughs> and Michel Foucault's Le Mo Les, Les Mots et Les Choses. You know, and I had miscalculated my <laughs> attempt here for early quick fame in the translating business. So, you know, translation was always there, was always, uh, uh, in a way, central. Later on, I came to think of it even more profoundly as uh, uh, that it is important to change, and I taught that for many years because I never liked teaching creative writing, but all, always liked to teach translation or writing through translation, as it is the closest way to read a poem is to translate it. So it is also the best way of learning something about another, another piece of, uh, of writing. And I finally got, came to kind of the realization uh, that Robert Kelly also has in a, in a lovely sense, and that is that language itself is translation. That is, you know, if you work something in language, it comes out of physiological, uh, neurological sparks somehow, you know, it is translated from a, from an, an, a physical incarnation, from a bodily uh, notion into something that we call language, right? Uh, so all language is translation and therefore literary translation as such is only one aspect of the language game or of doing something with language. And what was very important for me eventually was to uh, deconstruct the hierarchy of saying the original poem in the, you know, that is the language and translation is just repetition in a lesser register, is just bad imitation and so on. But to say no, a poem in fact is all the translations it can give rise to. A poem is not that one single canonical print thing, because even if you look at the poet's first drafts, and then the way the poem is published in a magazine first in the company of others, then in the first volume, in a given volume of poems, then in a selected, and then in a collected works, that poem is a different poem every time it is published because of its context. So it is a translation of itself on and on. In the oral too, the poet reading it, the poet then it being translated as a language. So that poem to me is the integral, if you want, of all its possible instantiation, which breaks down that, that hierarchy that, you know, uh, between translation and original poem.